So I'm ready to preach this morning because I believe God has given me a word. Get out your phones, get out your Bibles, and we're going to go right into God's word. Um, we are in week three of an eight-week series that we are calling Relationship Goals. And um, this series is really starting to uncover and help a lot of people. Um, a lot of us need help in our relationships. And it's one of those things that we don't really talk about in church because it's one of those things that we feel should automatically be impacted by the relationship we have with Jesus. And so we don't talk about specifics like if I just get better, all my relationships will get better. And that is true. But sometimes you need some specificity with what we're talking about. Like sometimes I need to know what does God's word say about certain things and certain issues and certain people and certain problems? And we've just decided to tackle something that everybody deals with, but there's not a lot of clarity on. And um, today, I want to go down this journey. Um, but before I do that, I want to see who's in the room, okay? So I need everybody to help me right now. Even those who are watching online, I need you to help me with this, okay? So if I say uh, um, something that... Um, agrees with your demographic currently in life, I want you to make some noise, okay? So I need all the people in the room to make some noise if you are single and available in the room. You better clap, girl. You better clap. She said, woo! Now I need everybody to open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look down the road, okay? Okay, so, so we got our single and available people in the room. Okay, how many people are dating or engaged right now? Dating or engaged? They still making decisions. <laughs> they, they're like, woo, woo. <laughs> Okay, how many people in the room are married? Yeah! Some of the single people are so mad right now. Like, Calm down. We're excited. Um, so now that I know who's in the room, um, I was thinking about the subject I was going to talk about today, and I went back to my childhood, and I want to see if we may have had similar childhoods, okay? So there was this song that used to be sung like on playgrounds and with other children, and it went something like this. It was like, uh, Michael and Natalie sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S. And then, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, okay, so, so, um, so we had similar childhoods, okay? So this is what I was thinking, and this may be an overstatement. This might be an overstatement. But I was thinking about our relational journeys, and that might be, that, that, that phrase, that, that saying might have been the first time there was an explanation of relational progression in any of our lives. Think about it. People say, psychologists say that from the age of birth to five, you learn the most that you will ever learn cognitively about how you're going to live your life. And most parents aren't sitting down with three and four year olds saying, this is how relationships should go. This is, these are the progressions. So our first real explanation is first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage. And when I look at that, if that's what's programmed deep down in our minds and our hearts about relationship progression, it's a very vague and incomplete statement. Love, marriage, baby. I don't know how that works in your life, but I haven't walked up to many people and just loved them. That's right. Enough to say, can we get married? And then enough to have a baby with you. <laughs> and because we live in a fallen world and our society is backwards and perverse, that sure is not the progression in everybody's life. Sometimes it's baby first. Then because we had a baby, might as well marry you. And since we married, Lord, could you please help me to love her? Or sometimes it's love, and then there's a baby, and we're not really too sure about how we can trust each other, so maybe we'll get married. 
And just think about all the different scenarios. And so I said, God, why is that so incomplete? He said, Michael, I want you to help define a progression of relationship so that people can understand and know and reprogram, be transformed by the renewing of their mind, that there is a God way of progressing in relationship that has more parts than just love, marriage, baby. And I want to give that to you today. So this is what I think the relationship progression should look like, okay? The, the first one should be singleness. And I know that's not a popular one, but if you've never heard a message taught about singleness, you need to go back and listen to last week's message. Yeah. Okay. Singleness is probably the most important time of your life because it's the time where God gets to reveal to you who you are. You become self-aware. You find purpose. You get identity. And Matthew tells us that we're supposed to love God, love ourselves. And then out of that love relationship, we can accurately love others. But most of us are trying to figure out how to love others before we learn how to love ourselves. So we're always looking to them to, incomplete, to make complete our deficiencies because we never learned to be okay with us. And so I'm encouraging you to go back if you have not and listen to last week's message. Me and my wife were listening to it again yesterday because I listened back like game film. How can I get better? How can I keep going? And I was listening about 25 minutes again. I said, that is good. And not because I was preaching it. We were literally getting ministered to because God speaks through me. I'm just a vessel up here on Sunday mornings. Half of the stuff, I don't know what I'm saying. I just go back to my notes and I look back and I'm like, God, you said that through me? Thank you. And so this is a relationship of trying to get something to you. But as I was watching back, I said, man, if people would know what God wanted to do in their lives without a person and just with them and to be content and okay in that season, they would be ready for marriage. The statistics say that 50% of all marriages end in divorce. The staggering thing about that is the, the figure for Christian marriages are almost the same. So why? If we got God and the Holy Spirit and songs and worship and accountability, why is it ending up the same? I suggest to you it may not be a relationship problem. It may be a singleness problem. And God wants to deal with our singleness. So go back and watch that. So first, it should be singleness. Then it should be what I'm going to talk about today, intentional dating. Everybody say intentional. intentional. Now, this is something that is not really talked about, but I believe this is the next progression, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Intentional dating. And then there should be an engagement, the, per the period of time where we are committed and planning towards our wedding or the time that we're going to um, make this thing consummated before God in um, holy matrimony. And then after engagement, there should be marriage, okay? And after marriage, there should be love. Now, Pastor Michael, why would you say love after marriage? I need to know that I love them before marriage. Have you read 1 Corinthians 13? Because the type of stuff you have to do to really love somebody, I don't know if you can truly do that in a full manner without sacrificing and giving up a lot for that person. I truly believe that you can like somebody a whole, 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 whole bunch. But until you have to give to that person like Christ gave for the church, lay down his life and sacrifice him, until she eat off your plate. And ain't nothing else open for you to get to eat that night? And until the, the, you're in a position where they're sick and you got to take care of them but still do your job and be like, there's certain things you don't learn until you get in the covenant. Let me prove it to you. How much did you love God before you accepted him as Christ? Most of us didn't learn to love God until after we got in covenant with him. And once we got in covenant with him, then we started to progress on our relationship of walking in love with him. So I just suggest to you that the love really gets solidified, identified, and really becomes real after you get married. Some of y'all are like, dang it. I told my wife, I said, after studying the word of God, you know how people be talking about they were in puppy love and all that other stuff. We wasn't in puppy love. We was just in heat. <laughs> I, I, 
I, I, I, see, what happens is this generation, we confuse passion with love. You just think because you're passionate about something, it's love. No, 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 baby. That's another L word of four letters, but it's called lust. We're, we're, we're engaged in what we see and what we feel and what we hear in the moment. But God wants to reveal to us love for him first and then love for another person. So that's the next progression. And then out of our love, we should reproduce. We, we should reproduce, hear me again, out of our love. Not out of our dysfunction. I counsel a lot of people who have babies because the person they're in relationship with won't pay attention to them. So they have a baby with that person so that they can give their full attention to somebody who needs them. I want you to see how sick and twisted that is in its seed form. Not that you're a bad person, but that child can never fulfill the void. That you have placed in that person. And so what happens is many times people stay together because it's a business arrangement. They stay together because we got kids. We got to be together. But let me help you. Your kids only can drink from the well that is in that house. And you think because you're not arguing in front of them. They feel it. They see it. They hear it. It's the atmosphere that is in their house. And then you're mad when they reproduce after their own kind. Somebody in your family has to stand up and break the generational curses. I think there's some people in this room this morning that are saying when it comes to relationship, it's not going to end the same way because I'm going to invite God into my relationships. And then I put this last point, repeat. Because I really feel like some people think that if they just get through this process, that it's good. I, I, I worked on my singleness. Now I'm intentionally dating. I got engaged, we got married, we love each other, we got children, and that's it. That's why the divorce rate for people over 45 has increased in the past 25 years. Because their project is gone. The thing we had in common to work on, our children, are gone. So now when I come home, I'm not asking for homework. I'm not asking. I'm not getting them new J's. I'm not asking where's cheerleading practice. I got to look at you. We got to talk. We can go to the movies all day, every day. But I don't want to because I don't know you because I haven't I haven't kept perfecting myself. And so the greatest thing that you can do in relationship progression is repeat this cycle again. Put it back up there. After you get through this whole thing, you never need to stop being single in your relationship. What do you mean, Pastor Mike? I'm talking about what's the last thing you did to perfect yourself? What, what, what's the last thing you did to add to the marriage? Did you go back and take a finance course so y'all money can be like plat, 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 plat? Did you, did you figure out another language so when you go to France, you can be able to see if they're serving you good food or not? Did you add anything to the relationship? Many people stop perfecting who God's created them to be because they joined with somebody else. And, and, and I'm, all I'm saying to you is once we move this, God says, I want to keep. I had a plan for you before you were formed in your mother's womb to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and give you a few. I want you to keep working on your singleness. And then if your marriage is going to last and be vibrant and have passion, I want you to keep intentionally dating. Yes. When's the last time you took your wife, your husband out on a date? Come on now. Me and my wife have to plan that stuff. Yesterday, I told her, I said, baby. I want to go out with you next Friday, and I want you to get sexy. <laughs> you know how you just... She said, babe, I'm eight months pregnant. I said, you better drape something over that stomach, girl. <laughs> you better drape something over that. And she know what that means to me, and I know what that means to her. Why? Because we're going to intentionally date. We're going to make time. And what that does is that keeps it fresh. Don't just be with your mate chilling in the bed, watching movies. What happened to the pursuit? What happened to the thing that you, when, when you couldn't have her, you was chasing her. But now you're hearing like, hey, hey. And, and that's what we have to do. So keep going through the process. And, and I just want you to keep going on. You should be having engagements. Married people hear me what I'm saying. You should have engagements. Engagements. 
There are more saved people who have horrible relational lives and sexual relationships. And that's not God's intention. The only reason he said that you're supposed to abstain from that stuff in a marriage relationship is when y'all fasting and praying and both of y'all agree. Y'all not ready. So if one party's like, I didn't feel God say that. I didn't. Y'all better hear the word. And, 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 and a couple weeks from now, I'm going to do a whole message on the power of sex. And, and I don't want parents to get scared. I shouldn't bring my children on. They already know. Yes. Baby, if they are in the third grade, they already know what's going on. But wouldn't it be better if they got a biblical standpoint instead of a ro- worldview from social media and e-news and... Okay. So I'm encouraging every parent, get your kids here, okay? Because you need to, I didn't learn the stuff I learned about sex from my parents or a, a spiritual being. I learned it in sixth grade in the locker room. And it distorted my worldview for almost 15 years. And my parents who love God and are pastors and have worshiped had no idea what was being infiltrated into my life. Hear me when I say that it's time for the church to stand up and help people get the tools that they need to live. Not just exist. Oh, y'all can clap better than that. Because some of the brokenness that you've been dealing with is because nobody told you the right way to do it. And so we got to keep doing these things. And so today, I'm going to take the time to talk about dating. And I know some of you are like, dating, man, I'm past that stage. I, I've, I'm married. I'm, I'm in this. But, but this is what I want to help you understand. That because this is not talked about, many people don't know how to talk about it. And so when your children, your grandchildren, you, or anybody gets into this realm, we just kind of leave it alone. And, and we're one of those things that we, we say stuff like, I wouldn't have picked them. You didn't teach them how to pick. Like, like you know how people, I don't know who the, pit, the fruit picker in your house is, but you know there's somebody in your house that knows how to go to the produce section and they knocking on stuff and shaking stuff and woo. And they can tell if if I'm not the fruit picker in my house. But I've learned if you get around the person who can pick fruit well, they will teach you how to pick fruit. Most people, when it comes to relationships, were not taught how to pick fruit. And so we get into things and and, and we're frustrated and like, I just can't believe I raised them out of the night. And they just bring him in here and just and look at him. Look at him. Like and there's but no, no matter how educated they are, no matter how much you taught them about God, you didn't teach them how to pick fruit. And so today I want to help us learn how to pick fruit. Okay, so um, this is what we're going to do. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, the children of Israel were in a place where they were just disobeying God. God had literally parted the Red Sea for them. He had done so many amazing things for them, providing manna for them. And they just kept making up their own idols and going their own way and doing their own thing. And then this is what the word of God comes in Hosea 4, 6. It says, my people are destroyed for the lack of what? Knowledge. They don't know. And I'm just trying to help us know some things so that we can be able to see clearly what the message version says. I love it. It says, my people are ruined. Because they don't know what's right and they don't know what's true. So the title of today's message is The Myth of Dating. The Myth of Dating. And I'm going to try to dispel a few myths that we may have about dating and see what God says about these things. The first myth I want you to write down is that dating is biblical. That's a myth. Dating is not biblical. Some of you are like, okay, pastor. Then why are we talking about it? Because it's a real issue in our society, in our culture. The Bible is very um, selective and specific on what it talks about in relationship. And it's pretty silent when it comes to this thing called dating or courtship. 
And so this furthers our problem of not knowing how to get into relationship because we're supposed to consult the word of God on certain things. But what scripture do I go to to see what I'm supposed to do? And so then we just try to get to marriage. And then I know what it says about marriage because there's a lot of stuff about marriage. But dang, I picked wrong. So I'm trying to make this thing work with the wrong ingredients. And this cake is nasty. (laughs) Even though it's not very specific on The topic of dating, the Bible is very clear on what type of company we should keep, on the boundaries we should set in relationship, and the character of the people that would be life partners with us. And so we're going to pull some different things together and draw some context clues and see what type of person we should be dating. But the reason I want to say this is because I really feel like I could have left this point out and just gone on, but I'm tired of the church not knowing what it's talking about. Like people, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 6 and 18 about, no, it doesn't say that about dating. And we need to be able to know that as we communicate with people what the word of God says. Let me just give you a little bit of history. Dating and courtship, those are um, um, ideas that were man-made that were made about 200 years ago, okay? And it was a way to get people in relationship, a single man and a single woman trying to find out if they were compatible so they could get in, go further in their relationship in marriage. Courtship, because some people are like, no, dating is bad. Courtship is what, it, they're both man-made. I want everybody to hear me say this. And so whatever you decide to do, okay, that's good with you. But you got to put God in the middle of it. See, because courtship was usually done with the parents being right there at every moment. So literally, you wouldn't kiss, you wouldn't touch, you wouldn't hold hands, you wouldn't hug. And every time you meet, both sets of parents would be there right with you, just staring. (laughs) How much intimacy do you think that you can develop with mommy and daddy sitting there all the time? So a lot of those marriages didn't work. There was a whole bunch of these things that happened. But I do believe that if we put God in the middle of this situation, we can find out what the word of God says. So the first myth is that dating is biblical. It's not biblical, but we can draw context clues from what God is trying to say. The second myth, dating is wrong. Dating's not wrong if God is in the middle. And I want everybody to hear me. That is a huge caveat. Dating is not wrong if God is in the middle. And many of us try to do things without God and we ask for his blessing and his results. God bless this relationship that is horrible from the beginning and is totally jacking up my purpose. Just bless it, God. Okay, let's be honest. How many people have prayed a backwards prayer before? Like you knew you was doing wrong, but you was just asking God to just come on in and, and just soup that. All I'm saying to you is when you put God in the middle of something, everything changes because everything surrounds God. We're not asking God to come and surround it. Get the picture. When God is in the middle, everything surrounds God. Not us doing something and asking God to surround it. So whatever you do, you need to put God in the middle. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1031 that talks about this. And and, and I, I honestly had this thought. Dating is like the second job interview. You know, like for a real good job, like a good high paying job, you don't get one interview. You may have one, two, three, even four interview. Like if it's a really good job, high responsibility, all that, you might have a, listen, dating is a second interview. There's some things I should know about you in our first interview. Can I stand your smell? Like, we let people get into this next level of us being exclusive to try to get to know each other, and they didn't even pass the first level of the test. Do do we even believe the same things? Ah. See, we let people into this space where then it becomes serious, and we're Facebook official, and everybody knows, and they weren't even supposed to make it past the first interview. They weren't even supposed to get to meet the other people in my life. See, and I want you to know the difference because some church people are really bound and locked up. It's okay to go on a date because a date is an event. A date is not a commitment. 
And some of y'all need to stop acting like dates are committed. Oh my God, I just went on a date with Bobby and Bobby had just me and him and we're taking pictures. And it was, a, it was an event. It happened. It was over. You should assess it. You should see if there's any qualifications that were on the list of my priorities and visions that will allow this person to see me again or even get a second interview. See, the thing about good jobs is they know what they're looking for. And if you come to the first interview sagging your pants, your hair not cut, you can't talk, all this other stuff, they're not going to call you back. But because we're lonely, we give people who are underqualified second interviews. Okay. Okay. Because there's a shortage in our company. We let unqualified people fill positions that they don't have the ability to fill. And what do they end up doing? Damaging the company. They cost us more than they're worth. So, so dating is not wrong if God is in the middle. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, so whatever you do, whether you eat, you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So when you date, your dating relationship should be done for the glory of God. How you date should bring glory to God. Let me help you ask some questions to yourself. See, these are some good questions. Is who I'm dating bringing glory to God? How they live, how they talk, what they listen to, is it bringing glory to God? Well, they smart and they got a good job and, and, and they find and they got their issues, but I'm going to bypass that because God has shown me to be a cultivator and to be the one that helps people become and not the man that's supposed to lead you. He's supposed to cultivate you. If she had whole tendencies that attracted you to her, do you think that turned off without a life transformation when she got with you? You like that she wears the leggings, she liked that she wears the leggings, and they like that she wear the leggings. I'm just trying to come to your house to let you know that, that until you get to the place where you understand that who I'm talking to should be living their life to glorify God, you're starting off with some wrong ingredients. Another question you could ask yourself is how we are dating bringing God glory. Am I in the back of a car in a parking lot somewhere? Come on. Y'all already know, I've been outside of somebody's window at 2.30 a.m. in the morning, got class at 6 a.m., out there trying to, are you, are you up? I'm in the wrong. And if somebody saw me or caught me, would my witness be destroyed? Would I be able to say anything about my relationship with Jesus if they saw my text messages? I'm just trying to give you a formula to be able to see if this relationship is good for you or not. Myth three, dating is a destination. It surprises me how many people date for long periods of time. Like, this is where we at. <laughs> how long y'all been dating? 15 years. <laughs> what did you just say to me? There is a kid in pure puberty as long as you've been dating. What are you talking about? And, and so the thing you have to start asking yourself is why? Why haven't we taken that step into covenant? Why haven't we moved past where we've been into commitment? What is those things that, is it because we're not living our life godly? Is there because we have reserves? Is it because I really know who you are and I love you and we've had kids together and we've built relationship, but I trust you enough to be with you? I don't trust you enough to trust you. I mean, this is real life. Like, as long as we, right here, we can do this, but I'll never let you get close enough. Because I know who you really are. That means you're not supposed to be with them. It doesn't matter how long y'all been together. You are delaying what God would have for you. I was in the airport the other day with my friend Charles. And, and we, we got off of a plane and we had to catch a connecting plane. And, and this is what we had to do. 
we had come from a place, landed, and we were trying to get to another place that would take us to the level we wanted to go. But because we were in one spot, we had to take transportation to the other spot. Now, now let me give you a definition the Holy Spirit gave me about dating. He said, dating is transportation to a relational target. It's, the, it's supposed to be the vehicle. This dating thing is not supposed to be the place where we stay. It's supposed to be the place that takes us to marriage. It's the thing that's supposed to take us to covenant, okay? So we were on the plane. We got off one plane, and we wanted to get up to another level, but what we had to do was ride what they call a tram. And we rode the tram from Terminal A to Terminal C. And once we got on the tram, it was our transportation to where we really wanted to be, the intended target. And it's a beautiful thing to understand because they don't want you to stay on the tram. How do you know, Pastor Mike? They don't put a lot of seats there. <laughs> they put enough there for you to hang on, Come on so you can get to the destination. And when you date too long, you are now putting yourself in a position to sit down in a place that was supposed to just be transportation. And, and I want you to see this so clearly that when you do that, it will be uncomfortable because you were never meant to stay there. God wants you to get to the intent or get off. See, we was at Terminal A, but between Terminal A and Terminal C was Terminal what? Get off. If you realize that riding this dating train, I'm, I'm going the wrong way. I actually need to be at this terminal, and I'm at this terminal, and I need, you know what? This is not for me. I, I'll walk. I don't need to be surrounded in this company. I'll get off, and I'll walk. Why? Because taking the long route sometimes builds stamina in you that will produce what you really need. You may not find who you're supposed to be with riding this dating train. It's when you get off the thing and start walking and you say, hey. All I'm trying to say to you is dating is not supposed to be a destination. It's supposed to be transportation to where you really want to go. And some of you need to hear me say this. Recreational dating is dangerous. Like, I just date him, and I just date him, and then, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. When, when somebody introduced somebody to you, and you'd be like, oh, yeah, you, we, we used to date. Oh, y'all don't, okay, they don't say that. We hooked up. We were just friends. Somebody just said that just devastated friends. I done said that so many times. <laughs> but just think about all these code words that we use, friend, friends with benefits. And what ends up happening in this situation is we get damaged because we were not supposed to be in this place sitting. We were supposed to be transporting. But you know if he or she doesn't want to get with you and there is no plans. If you have to keep asking, well, what do you see in our future? And there is a vague, blurry image of like, yeah, one day we might. You know what? That day has come. Because I have too much purpose in me. To sit here and be in a relationship that has no aim. Ain't the series called Relationship? You can't have a goal if you don't have an aim. And some of us just over here shooting at everything. And God said, no, 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 no. Pull it back. Wait. Wait. God, I'm ready to shoot. Wait. Turn to the left. Down just a little bit. Boop. There it is. And God will allow you to get in right relationship with right people. So what do you want us to do, Pastor Mike? You done told us everything, date and aim. <laughs> I want you to do this. I, I want you to be focused on intentional dating. I want everybody to write that down. Even if you're married, even if, I want you to write that down. Intentional dating. What does that mean? I'm dating with purpose. I'm dating with the end in mind. Pastor Mike. What are you saying? If you can't remotely see yourself after going on a couple of events, which are dates with this person, you cannot see yourself being led or you cannot see yourself being connected with this person and you can't see yourself marrying them, 
You do not need to be in relationship with them to figure out and see if it can work. And the problem is, it's how God made us. Women, naturally, you are created to nurture. If you give a woman a seed, she's going to give you a baby. Like they're incubator. They will take something in a state that it is not and they will grow it to what it's supposed to be. You give a woman a bag of groceries. Guess what she gives you? Dinner. You give her a house. She gives you a home. That's what a woman. But the problem is you were created out of man and God created him first. So you can never be the person to cultivate him. God asked man to cultivate the woman. And what's happening in society is we have a bunch of passive men who want somebody to take care of them, that want somebody to cook and clean and do all these other things, but you have not done your priority by leading the household. And the only way you can lead the household is be in communion with God daily. And if you're not walk, Adam walked and talked in the cool of the day. Every him and God had a connected relationship, and without that, you don't know how to lead the woman of God that He's created you to lead. And so, what I'm saying to you is, everything that I'm talking about in this whole thing has to be intentional. Just everybody say it, intentional. intentional. Okay, last myth. Dating is harmless. That is a horrible myth. Dating can be devastating if it's done in the wrong timing and without God. I just think about it. How many relationships that people have got in where they have literally invested and sown so much time, energy, and effort into something that would only take from them? Many of us are products of that sitting in this room. But look what Proverbs 14, 12 says. It says, there's a path before each person that seems right. Like that relationship seemed right when I got in it. That, that person seemed right. But he said, it ends in death. Another translation says destruction. What are you trying to say, Pastor Mike? There, there can be a death to purpose because you got in relationship with the wrong person. Open up your heart to the wrong person and let them discourage your dream. You used to be passionate about something and you got with the wrong person and it started to crush what God placed on the inside of you. You have to be careful of who you align your heart, your soul, and your mind with because it can damage your purpose. Some of you are supposed to be doing things that you were created to do, but you got in relationship in a season you were supposed to be focusing in your singleness with the person you would not end up marrying, and they crushed something in you and talked about your self-esteem and got you in a place where you could not believe in your own self, and now you're sitting here with a death of time. You've lost time, and you've lost vision, and you lost hope because you were in a wrong aligned relationship. Pastor Mike, why are you going so passionate about this? Because I want you to see and I want you to hear that who you align yourself with is more important than anything that you can do in your life. Because who you align yourself with and let into your heart will begin to guide what you do in your life. What 1 Corinthians 15 says, verse 33, it says, don't be fooled. Don't do it. Bad company corrupts good character that's why you see these good girls get with bad dudes and bad girls get with good dudes and they turn like they didn't used to do that why are they doing that the word is telling you clearly what happens right here look at verse 34 it says think carefully about what is right when you're dating somebody you need to stop and think is this what i'm supposed to be doing is this what's right? Does this li- do I line up right with what God is saying in my life? It says, and then it just says, stop sinning. Just stop. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. Why? Because if you're making decisions in a sin state, your flesh will always lie to you. Your flesh will always tell you, no, no, bro, that's good for you, bro. That is really a blessing. Look what God made, beautifully and wonderfully made in his image, all of his image, all of her. And and we're doing all of this other stuff. And God's saying, you can't make a right decision right now because your flesh is ruling. Stop sinning and think about what is right. 
I just encourage many people in this room, even if it's this, this whole dating thing doesn't apply with you, stop sinning and then pray about it. Stop sinning. Stop. Keep. The, let that door close. Repent. Turn. And then let God speak to you about it. I want to give you this, this, this thing that touched me this week. My wife thinks that Chris Brown was supposed to take Michael Jackson's place as the greatest entertainer of all time. And then he had a fall. And, and it's one of those funny things that he had a moment in his life. We were watching a documentary this week, and um, he basically talked about being in a toxic dating relationship. Changed, he said this out of his own mouth. He said, it changed the course of my entire life. He said, one night that was bad for me in a dating relationship changed my career, changed how people viewed me, changed how I view myself. He said, I'm dealing with these monsters on the inside. One, it's not even his wife. And because he was careless with who he got in relationship, because God wasn't the middle, because it wasn't, it changed the course of his life. My question is, who are you in relationship that's changing the course of your life? And if it's not somebody who's pushing you towards purpose, it's time to get out of that thing. Look at this anchor scripture, and I want everybody to remember this. This Philippians chapter 2, and this blessed me so much. It says, for God is working in you, giving you the desires and the power to do what pleases him. Look how awesome this is. At salvation, God, no matter how messed up, jacked up, how many times you've um, fallen, he said, at salvation, inside of you, you get the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the one who is sent alongside of you to help. And once you get him, he is giving you the desire first. And then I love that God does not just give us a desire and not give us power. He gives us the power to do what he calls us to do. He gives us the desire and the power to do what? What pleases him. When it comes to your dating relationships or any relationships, I want you to know when you invite God into the situation, he'll give you the desire to do it right, and then he'll fund it. He'll give you the power to do it right. And what is he trying to do? He's giving you the desire and the power to please him. That's how good our God is. That's how awesome that he is to all of us. Verse 14 says, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Look what you should do in dating. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Your dating relationship should be able to shine. And I want to talk to some of my people who are divorced and older and you got your own stuff and you got your own house or you may be widowed or your husband left or something happened. And, and, and we get in this space where we, we grown. I've been doing this my own way for a long time. And so now you start talking to somebody and dating them and they have their own house and they have their own house. And so y'all just spend the night at each other's house. I don't care how old are you. Something will rise up. You did not become impenetrable because you were 55. And it goes against God's word because you can't shine that light. Would you tell your son and your daughter to do the same thing? That be in that place and put yourself in the way of temptation. No, you want your relationship to be something that shines. Everybody say shine. shine. You want your relationship to shine. And that's what God wants for every person in this relationship. Pastor Mike, why are you telling us all of this? Why are you saying all these things about dating and myth? Because if you get the right perspective, you'll be able to set proper boundaries. And boundaries are biblical. The reason why people get messed up in relationship is they don't have proper boundaries. I'm going to end you with this scripture right here. Proverbs 4.23. And I want you to understand that boundaries are one of the things that God uses to help us reach purpose. Guard your heart above all. It. Do y'all see how important it is to put up the fence, get the guard dogs out there, get the barbed wire fence and the gun around your heart? Because if you don't, you will allow wrong things to influence your heart. And if things influence your heart, what does it do? You're, it determines the course of your life. So, so let me help you. If the will of God is that you should just please him, 
What ends up happening is when we allow people into our heart very easily, we begin to go against the will of God. We begin to go away from what God has said for us. And we have to be ones that say, no, 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 no. I'm going to set my eyes and my heart on the things that please God. I got gates. You can't get in this that easy. And when you recreationally date and you do all that stuff, you set a, per, a, a permission for anybody to walk in and walk out. And then what you end up doing is putting yourself in a position to take your eyes off of pleasing God. And I've done it before, but I put myself in a position that I'll do what he or she wants me to do instead of please God. Dating is so serious for all of you. And I begin to think, God, how can I really help these people understand what practical steps how, how, how can we move past what we've done in dating and just make it so haphazardly? I talked to him. I talked to them. I talk, God said, I want you to focus on guarding this. If you would get with me and I could get with you, then I'll teach you and show you how to love somebody else. Man, there's so much that I, I have to say on this that I told them in the first service that what we're going to do is next week we're going to create a forum. Well, I'm going to do something called relationship goals uncut because there's some stuff that I want to say that I can't say on camera because there's a real avenue that we need to talk. L let me just give you one of those things. See, because some of y'all like, well, OK, Pastor Mike, I know the myths. I see what's happening. But how do I pick this person? How do I see characteristics that I'm supposed to find? Let me give you one. I'm excited about this. So let's go to the first relationship in the garden. The first relationship was between Adam and Eve. OK, now watch before Eve ever came into the picture. Adam was found in the presence of God. God placed him in the presence. This word is a funny Hebrew word. It means a lot of things. It means spot. It means the place where there's an open door. It also means the place where God is. So let me help you. Eden is the spot for the moment where the presence of God is an open door to heaven. That's why Adam did not have to worship to get in the presence of God. He was already in the presence of God. He didn't have to praise and sing and all that other stuff. We have to do that because we were put out of the presence of God now watch this the first man was found he found him in the presence of God practical don't ever date a man who hates the presence of God because if he does not like the presence of God he will not be able to get proper instructions to be able to lead you. And what some of you interesting females do is try to go to the club and find a man outside of Eden, outside of the presence of God. And then you marry him and then you try to drag him into the presence of God. You go and worship. It'll never happen. See, see I want to help you be able to live by knowing that God has a way that we're supposed to do this thing. And he wants us. To do it his way. Yeah. I'm hoping that you hear the heart of this. The myths of dating, there's so many of them out there, but the thing that you want to remember is that God's working in you to give you the desire and the power to do in dating what pleases him. And if you just please your heart, I've messed up so many times in relationship, but my heart really was to please God. Man, I messed up. Get back to pleasing God. That's what repenting is. See, I mess up every sermon. I play drums. I mess up every time I, I play drums. But you would never know it because my comeback time is very quick. You'll never know. And that's what God wants for all of our relationship. I messed up. Come back to pleasing God. Oh, I failed again. Come back to pleasing God. You know, I just got to reset real quick. I made a wrong decision, but I reset. Don't fall and stay there. Don't have a bad moment and just stay there. Go and come right back. Because my heart is to please God.